I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the sixth chapter of Bradbury and Carney's Intimate Relationships book. So today we'll be discussing personality and personal history. So we'll be talking about things like personality traits, what their consequences are in relationships, our early childhood experiences, and some theoretical interpretations of that. But let's start by talking about why that while physical attraction is important, we also want people with a good personality. So we look for personality traits like kindness and trustworthiness, reliability, openness, and good, a good sense of humor. And that a good sense of humor means the same sense of humor that we have because we don't want to be with somebody who laughs at dumb stuff um, because we don't laugh at dumb stuff. Personality can be defined as the distinctive qualities that characterize an individual. And they're relatively stable across the lifetime and situations and they influence how we behave and adapt to the world. Now, picture to the right there is Lewis Terman, and he studied the lives of intellectually gifted people. He actually did a longitudinal study of 1,400 children who he, he developed the Stanford Binet test. Uh, and this was started in the early um, 19 teens. But uh, he studied these children across their lifetimes. Uh, now, he, he passed in um, the 50s, but other researchers continued the research. And one of the things they found was that unhappy marriages are due to a predisposition to unhappiness in one or both of the spouses. So Terman was a trait theorist, and so he thought there was a, a, a corset of personality traits. I think of him more as an intelligence researcher, but pretty much the standard model that most people work from now is something called the Big Five model. And uh, this is out of order, but it's usually used uh, the acronym OCEAN, um, but I'll go through these individually. So negative um, affect or neuroticism is an inclination to experience unpleasant emotions. This means that some people are good in a crisis, and for some people, everything is a crisis. Introversion, extroversion, uh, do you recharge from social interaction and lively activity, uh, extroversion, or do you prefer to be by yourself and maybe, you know, and recharge that way? Uh, I should point out there's no good or bad on any of these characteristics. I think neuroticism has, has a, a negative, is kind of a negative term. Um, I prefer the term stability for neuroticism, but I think it gets more to the heart of what you're discussing. Openness to new experience means are you receptive to new ideas, approaches, and experiences? So do you enjoy going to a new restaurant or do you like going to eat at the same place all the time? And again, there's no right or wrong. Um, one of the things that researchers have found is that people who are very religious tend to be lower in openness. And one of the explanations is, um, I'm Catholic, so the Catholic mass is basically the same every week and wherever you go. And some people find that very comforting, that it's always the same thing. Agreeableness is um, selfless concern for others. Are you generous and trusting? Uh, I've seen it described, I think, better as uh, how do you feel about conflict? So are you willing to get into conflict or do you do anything you can to avoid conflict? Conscientiousness means are you disciplined, organized, punctual? Do you get the work done when it's supposed to be done? Or are you just kind of like, you know, things will get done uh, when they will. So uh, yeah, so ocean, O, openness, um, um, C, conscious, you can think of it that way too. Uh, personally, I am high in extroversion, openness, and conscientiousness, and low in neuroticism and uh, agreeableness. So, um, but you can take online tests to see where you are on the big five. Personality measures, as I said earlier, seem to stay consistent over time and can predict, be predictive of relationships later. So for example, uh, kids who have frequent and severe temper tantrums before age 10 are twice as likely to divorce. Uh, people who are high in negative affect are also vulnerable to poor relationships. Couples who rate high in agreeableness and conscientiousness tend to be happier. And so agreeable, this makes sense. Uh, they're, they get along and they try to get along and they're punctual and disciplined. And so that tends to make for happier couples. 
People who are married to disagreeable people say that they're treated with condescension and lack of respect and negative act affectivity and agreeableness seem to matter the most in relationships because they set the day-to-day -day emotional tone. And, you know, life is just a series of one day after another. So what are the consequences of um, negative affectivity and low self-esteem? So this is something called the dependence regulation model, and it demonstrates that people with low self-esteem underestimate how favorably their partners view them and so they tend to do things like overreact to criticism, they dismiss praise, and they tend to get angry. So uh, for them, low self-esteem seems to act like a personality trait, uh, meaning that it's stable and uh, across situations in the lifetime. They tend to underestimate the part, their partner's regard for who they are. They perceive the partner in an unfavorable light and um, express discontent. So they see rejection where it isn't. They see everything as a criticism. And uh, they tend to see the, the relationship in an unfavorable light too. And their partners actually become less happy with the relationship over time also. It's not fun to be with someone who's negative all the time. The family you're raised in is your family of origin. And it's believed that there are intergenerational transmission effects in those describe the influence that your family has on your later relationships. Now, 40% of children will see their parents divorce and children with unmarried parents face even more instability. Discord and divorce doubles the risk of adverse consequences in children, such as things like academic achievement, conduct and behavior, their psychological adjustment, self-esteem and social relationships. And it also affects the, their economic circumstances, uh, their parents' mental health, and their contact with one, I would say, or both of their parents, too. Children all, often show signs of distress long before a divorce happens, uh, if it ever even does, because children from homes with high marital discord can have difficulties, too. So it's not so much divorce as it is, as it is the marital discord. How does this impact later relationships? So children with turbulent family backgrounds tend to be more cautious towards relationships and they're more accepting of divorce. So they're more willing to see divorce as an option. They have less money and fewer people in their social networks on average, and they tend to experience more relationship distress and dissolution um, themselves. How would we interpret this? Well, we're gonna talk about attachment theory and social learning theory, but let's start with social learning theory. So it encourages us to think of families as a kind of training ground for the next generation of intimate relationships. So children learn about relationships from seeing how family members relate to one another. So abuse and neglect makes, leads to less fulfilling marriages, uh, even with a supportive spouse. And so these are the kind of the long-term impacts of this. So children who grow up in warm and nurturing families go on to feel more closely connected to their intimate partners 60 years later. The attachment theory view uh, comes up with this idea of an attachment behavior system, and that's an innate set of behaviors and reactions shaped by evolution that helps ensure our safety and survival. And the evidence for this theory is all around us. We also discussed it in chapter two. But yeah, hospitals take care of people, cemeteries, people take care of dead people, and daycares, uh, people take care of children. And so we're all trying to help out. Now, John Watson, who's pictured to the right, believed that nurturing children made them needy and spoiled. And so he was keen on separating children from their parents and raising them without genuine affection. But later scientists obviously overturned this view. He wrote a book in the 1920s called Psychological Care of Infant and Child. And he really stressed things like schedules that children, which there's some truth to in my experience, children react well to knowing what's gonna happen next. Okay, so now we do this, then we do this other thing. But he also believed, uh, as it says, that um, children that showing children affection makes them weak. And so he said that uh, when you're putting your child to bed at night, don't give them a hug or a kiss, that uh, if you have to, shake hands with them. So, uh, and he had several children, and they said that wasn't a very good way to grow up. Working models of attachment develop along two dimensions, anxiety and avoidance. So 
Let's start with anxiety. When caregivers are consistent and available, um, and there's two ands there, people uh, develop a confident, positive sense of self. When caregivers are inconsistent and unavailable, people feel anxious, insecure, inadequate, and unworthy of care and attention. In terms of avoidance, uh, when we aim to restore proximity to a caregiver and are met with love and comfort, we believe that others are trustworthy and that we're valued. But if we're met with punishment and rejection, we conclude that others are unreliable and best avoided. So people low in anxiety and avoidance are securely attached, and that means they minimize the impact of negative events. People high in anxiety and avoidance are insecurely attached and tend to magnify the impact of negative events. So it's when times are stressful that you can see these differences too. So secure people tend to cope well. Anxious people will overuse whatever support they have available and they're usually dissatisfied even with that support. You know, can't you do more? What have you done for me lately? Avoidant people tend to become defensive and deny that they even have any need for support at all, that they can just, they can just handle it on their own. In both men and women, secure individuals reach out to their partner when uh, that person needs um, support and avoidant individuals tend to retreat. So we'll conclude with how do you overcome insecurity, even though we've already said that these are stable uh, characteristics across the life and um, situations. But I believe people can change. Uh, you can deepen your self-affirmation that you can identify an important and meaningful value, and this could be in terms of like religion or community or just some value that you have. Uh, you can adopt your parents, your partner's perspective. And I think this is, this is always wise. You should always, whenever you're in a disagreement, uh, why, what is the other person? What, what's their viewpoint on it? And can you, uh, they talk about this in counseling. Can, it's, can you repeat back what the um, other person's view is? So imagine what the other person is thinking about. Put yourself in their shoes. Elaborating on a compliment helps you overcome insecurity. Uh, so think of a time when you were complimented and think about why they said that and put it in positive terms. Uh, you can also increase psychological and physical closeness. So talk about personal questions. We become closer by the, you know, the, the stories that we tell each other. Uh, and they also recommend maybe doing some yoga together, which I cannot argue with. I think it's, that's fantastic. So that's chapter six, and thanks for listening.